And my first guest uh, for this morning's conversations, he's the chairman of the Tobago Business Chamber, uh, attorney at law, Mr. Martin George. Good morning, sir. Yeah, hi. Good morning to you and good morning to all your viewers. Well, thank you very much for joining me, sir. I'll start the conversation with the events that happened last week uh, with the licensing officers in Tobago. Um, the uh, Tobago Business Chamber actually uh, released a statement uh, uh, calling out what it has labelled oppressive actions by licensing officers, even questioning uh, what is the real objective there. Um, could you expand on that exactly? What is oppressive actions of licensing officers carrying out what some may argue as their duties and responsibilities? Right, okay, so the thing is, I mean, what we are concerned about is the manner in which the exercises were conducted in Tobago over that of period. Of all countries within the Latin and American the Caribbean region. that it appeared to have been done without due regard to the provisions of the THA Act. And I make specific reference to the THA Act by Section 25, which sets out that there are certain responsibilities and areas of governance in the fifth schedule which are under the purview of the THA. Two of those areas are specifically designated as, number one, licensing, and number two, highways and roads. So it would seem to me pellucid that in carrying out such an exercise, the licensing division and the Ministry of Transport ought to at least seek to work with or coordinate with the THA and ensure that the way it is done is not in a manner that is so disruptive to the lives of persons who are, you know, trying to, you know, go about their daily business, that it ends up creating the massive outcry, the public outcry that you saw. Um, I mean, the, we fully understand, we respect, we, um, you know, are in accordance with the authority of the licensing officers to do their jobs. There's no issue with that. However, from some of the things that persons were saying and the feedback you got from the public, it appeared that there was an especially heavy-handed approach by these officers in terms of the way they did it. There were persons who complained that they were, you know, stopped, you know, and made to wait for 45 minutes, an hour before the officers even attended to them. I mean, come on, you, 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 you therefore are creating chaos when you do that because if persons are on their way to work, on their way to pick up children, on their way to whatever, I mean, okay, if you stop me, then certainly you ought to have enough manpower to deal with me immediately. You know, you can't have me just sitting around waiting for this length of time and then, you know, you eventually come around to dealing with me after an hour of me just sitting there by the roadside waiting, you know, until you, you get to my vehicle. In addition to which, some of the items which they, you know, appeared to issue tickets and citations for, appeared with the greatest of respect to have little or nothing to do with roadworthiness of a vehicle. I mean, okay, I mean, someone complained that they got a ticket for a torn seat. You know, part of the, the fabric of the seat was torn and they got a license, they got a ticket for that. I mean, seriously, that, that certainly has little or nothing to do with the roadworthiness of a vehicle. It, it, we, we were told that someone um, was, you know, um, ticketed for having a, a win, one of their window glasses in the, the car, couldn't go all the way down. They got a ticket for that, if you understand me. So, I mean, yes, we fully understand that you need to have a road safety and security. And I mean, certainly if you're talking about essential issues such as, you know, you're talking about brakes, making sure persons, the horns are working, their tail lights, their stop lights, their brake lights. And yeah, you, I fully support that. But when you get to the theater of the absurd, where you are, you know, keeping somebody waiting in a line for over an hour and then giving them a ticket for having a rip on the, the seat of, of, of their car, then, I mean, it really begins to appear to be oppression 
rather than, you know, regulation. Well, Mr. George, your question is quite a strong word. And uh, though uh, we can have a conversation about the efficiency of systems, and I, I think you and I might actually agree a lot if we have that conversation on the inefficiencies here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I can make the argument that waiting 45 minutes an hour is just the price that I pay uh, for having certain infractions. Now, you've used examples such as a ripped um, car seat or a window not going down completely. But um, given, given that there's so many cars out there that are not in roadworthy condition, that do not even have inspection stickers, when, can't we make the argument that how this is the price I pay for not doing my part in terms of road safety? Sorry, just 64 the boys. Part, there, this is see. the price. I, I had to wait 45 minutes. I'm now putting myself in, in the shoes of somebody who would have received a ticket. You know, 45 minutes sets an hour to receive a ticket. I am complaining, yet uh, I am not up to par in terms of um, ensuring that my responsibilities and owning a vehicle is, is actually up to par. So, um, isn't that just the price that I'm paying for actually not doing my part? Well, the thing is, I mean, okay, the, the, the reality is that, yes, of course, you can, if one is um, to go into the minute of dotting every I and crossing every T in terms of the law, yes, of course, you can fi always find something that you can charge somebody for or find something that is wrong, you know? I mean, persons were charged for license plates listen listen to listen to the absurdity license plates on cars which were inspected and approved and passed and they had their inspection stickers and the license plate was they were charged for the license plate because they were told that the license plate is on fiberglass and you are not supposed to have a license plate on fiberglass material now how would a member of the public know that when you bought this license plate from one of the authorized dealers it is affixed on your car. It is in the standard, you know, description from the licensing office of black and white. It is clearly visible. All the letters are clearly legible. You carried that same vehicle to the authorized, you know, inspection stations. They inspected your vehicle. You have an inspection sticker. And then these licensed officers are coming out and giving you a ticket saying that that material on which the license plate is made is not an authorized material. How would a member of the public know that? And, and that's the level of absurdity that occurred during that exercise. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So we're talking about people with inspection stickers who got these, got these tickets. So, that, that, so they, they did everything in their power to comply, and yet still you are being ticketed for some frivolity. And that's what I call it. Because if it is that the license is the license plate is clearly visible, it's in black and white as recommended by the um, regulations, and it's been issued by an authorized license plate manufacturer, it's been inspected and approved. Nobody told you anything about the license plate when you, when you got your inspection sticker. Your inspection sticker is up to date. How is the ordinary citizen at fault in a scenario such as that? Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. George, for the sake of argument, we're assuming that um, those uh, number plates were actually from an authorized dealer, and we're assuming that such license stickers were not purchased. Uh, we, we're just making those assumptions for the sake of argument. No, but uh, no, no. The, the, in, in such a circumstance, I'm talking about circumstances where the officers actually approved. They, they looked at the license, the, um, the inspection stickers, and they had no challenge or difficulty with it. Mm -hmm. So there's no question of it being, you know, um, not authentic. Now, the Commissioner of Transport, uh, Mr. Clive Clark, uh, he's uh, made a statement. He says that how, uh, there's no bias uh, when uh, transport officers are carrying out their duties and responsibilities. The Minister of Works and Transport even uh, expressed his surprise at the response given. Uh, all these issues that you've just raised, um, has there been any further conversation with the Chief Secretary and the Transport Commission, and perhaps the Tobago Business Chamber, um, given the concerns over authorised inspection stickers and, and, and authorised uh, number plates? Um, has right. those issues and, been raised? Right, and the, the conversation also needs to expand to the question of the number of authorised inspection stations in Tobago, because from what we understand, there are only two 
you know so that certainly does not seem to be sufficient to service the population some people have had to resort to taking their vehicles to trinidad to an inspection station and coming back up so that's one of the things i saw that um the secretary for works and transport in tobago um from the THA has written asking for a meeting with the minister i saw that the minister did it say that he has no difficulty meeting with them? So, I mean, at that level of the politicians, I am happy to see what is the result of that. Um, we of the Tobago Business Chamber, we intend to also write to Minister, um, you know, of Works and Transport, asking for a meeting with him, you know, from our perspective as business owners. Now, I understand uh, the position taken uh, by the Tobago Business Chamber. Uh, the, the Chief Secretary, um, he... he he went a bit further. He says uh, that licensing officers are terrorizing Tobagonians. Um, in your opinion, uh, are those statements valid or, or do you think that perhaps the chief secretary was under the influence of subjectivity, given that uh, at that point, at that point, he, he chose not to reveal certain information regarding uh, a relative who was ticketed? Well, I mean, I can't speak for the secret chief secretary, and I mean, I, I wouldn't um, presuppose as to what was in his mind when he made that statement. Um, we of the Tobago Business Chamber have made no such statement, and I mean, we uh, will not at all venture anywhere near, you know, describing it as that, you know, um, in, in that manner, because we recognize that the licensing officers do have a job to do, and we, you know, we welcome them in doing their jobs. You know, we have no difficulty with that at all. All we are saying is that the manner in which it is, you know, exercised must be in a manner that is sensible, reasonable, and practical. Well, I want to move on now to the issue of national security on the island of Tobago. Uh, uh, the, the comments coming uh, from the Chief Secretary again in relation to Tobago uh, being treated as the, uh, and I quote, the bastard child uh, by the Ministry of National Security. And he said he's dissatisfied with how Tobago is treated. He's even uh, spoken of uh, the army uh, base in Tobago. He's spoken about uh, the uh, Coast Guard base um, in Scarborough. Um, he's spoken about the fire station in Scarborough as well. Uh, the situation on the island, uh, he's saying that it's being treated as a bastard child. Now, I'm not using this as any excuse or any justifiable reason, but uh, it seems as though the issues Tobago is facing are also the issues that Trinidad is facing with regards to inefficiencies and again, uh, uh, certain yeah. apparatus not being up to, is it, is it accurate to describe Tobago as being the bastard child or the, the red-headed stepchild as, as someone likes to phrase it, of the Minister of National Security. Yeah, the thing is, when you look at the comparison, um, I think some of those same problems are rampant throughout Trinidad also. So I'm not sure that there is any um, plan or, you know, d design by the Ministry of National Security to single out Tobago in that regard. I think the incompetence and the failings in the ministry are all round you know, throughout Trinidad and Tobago. So maybe the um, Chief Secretary, while speaking on behalf of Tobago, maybe sought to highlight the problem in Tobago that way. But it's something that I think we can all agree is, um, you know, endemic throughout both Trinidad and Tobago. You know, I mean, look recently with, with, with those two persons who unfortunately perished in that fire, you know, and th there was just an absence of a sufficient appliance, a fire tender, to be able to go and out the fire. I mean, how, how do you justify that? You know, and then you saw the Ministry of National Security say, well, they are trying to source fire tenders, you know. I mean, so clearly the, the, the shortages and the shortcomings are throughout both Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm not sure that um, it's a scenario where one can really make a case to say that Tobago has been singled out for particularly bad treatment in that regard. How much uh, does the, uh, the Minister of National Security's comments regarding his, uh, him not having the responsibility in formulating a crime plan has to play um, with everything that you've just mentioned? Um, he's made the argument it's not his duty and his responsibility. Uh, because, that, because of that approach and that mindset, do you think that the national security apparatus currently in the condition that it's in because of that mindset and that thinking. 
Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure because I mean, to be fair, I mean, I think the feelings in the ministry and the feelings in the you know provision of um, adequate outfitting and you know. Um, you know, resourcing of the, you know, police stations, the fire stations, the army bases, etc. They predated Mr. Hines's ascension to the office of minister in national security. So I'm not sure it's fair to lay the blame entirely at his feet. The question would be, more importantly, what has he done since he has, you know, attained that office because he's been there for quite some years? What has he done to turn the tide and reverse this trend of under-resourcing of these, um, you know, areas of his ministry when every year national security tends to get the largest slice of the budget allocation. So I think some level of accountability needs to be given in that regard as to where is that money going? Because the point is you cannot be receiving the lion's share of the budget every year. And then yet still you have fire stations throughout the country who are telling you repeatedly they have no fire tenders. So if a fire occurs, they cannot deal with it. I mean, of course, the locus classicus in this regard. And I mean, I think one which ought to make the Guinness Book of Records is the Scarborough Fire Station, which itself caught a fire and burned down, and they were not able to have equipment to out the fire in their own fire station. It burned down right now. The, the Scarborough fire station is still not back 100% operable because of that fire. So, I mean, if they can't even have equipment to out a fire in their own fire station, which is the headquarters of the fire services in Tobago, can you imagine if they will ever be able to attend to the needs of the ordinary citizens? Well, <laughs> we, it's been revealed that uh, even uh, the, the, the fire officers have, have used uh, personal funds to the tune of um, uh, a little over $350,000 to try and bring the Scarborough fire station back up to par. And at this point in time, they can't even get that money back. So, so right. the, the next question is the motivation of, of, of firefighters, of police officers to carry out their duties and responsibilities when at times they're very much helpless. Well, I mean, and, and the reality is that, look, I mean, we all are in scenarios at times where we don't have all the resources we have. I mean, I recall, I mean, back in the days, I mean, both my parents were school principals and they never had all the resources they needed from the Ministry of Education, but they would engage in, you know, adventures such as, you know, cake sales, bake sales, you know, um, they would help to organize the bazaars and the, you know, the, the school fundraisers to ensure that they would get the funds to get the equipment, get the, 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 the materials that they needed for the children. They would try to, you know, um, solicit donations from persons. So the thing is, we recognize that, look, at times we are short of materials, resources, but once you have that fundamental commitment to get the job done, I think that trumps all and you will find a way to be effective and efficient in the performance and delivery of your duty. So even as a fire officer, a police officer, you may not be working in the best conditions, you may not have the, the nicest of you know equipment or materials to work with, but somehow if you are committed to it, you will ensure that you get the job done. That, of course, is not to excuse the authorities from their responsibility to properly outfit and equip and resource the stations with what is needed by way of standard operating procedures. Mr. George, I hope we don't have to have any bake sales to build any fire stations or police stations in Tobago, because if that is the case, we're in a serious mess. Well, my, my final question to you, sir, is uh, uh, Tobago had a, a total of 10 murders uh, last year. The, for the year thus far, it's three. Uh, concerns going forward in terms of the crime on the island. I'm getting reports um, that uh, home invasions are still very much number one. Um, and, uh, but um, there are also concerns of the influence of, of, of also drugs on the island. Do you think uh, that enough is being done to curb that? I mean, only three for the year, and I can't believe I just said only three, but given that there were 10 last year, uh, do you think Tobago has learned the lessons that the police service on the island are working more assiduously to deal with the situation? Well, the thing is, I mean, we 
have not seen any signs of it yet. Um, there's a new ACP in charge of Tobago, Mr. Collis Hazel, and I saw over the weekend he made some very um, bold predictions about you know what he will do to reduce crime. So we are hopeful and expectant that you know um, it is you know not just talk and that there will be the action and the implementation to effect that but I mean there are so many several simple solutions that we of the Tobago Business Chamber have put forth over the years and they just do not seem to have as yet been implemented. I saw the Minister of Finance spoke over the weekend saying that um, there are mobile scanners coming for the ports and that's one of the things that we have spoken about repeatedly. We have said that the influx of drugs and guns comes to Tobago largely through the port, you know, because you have, I mean, the absurdity of it is that you have um, a personal scanner. So persons who are walking onto the boat from Trinidad, they are scanned. But you can drive on with a van load of guns and drugs, and there's no scanner. You hardly ever see sniffer dogs or anything of this sort. So therefore, what's the point of scanning the individual who's walking with a knapsack on his back? He can't carry an assault rifle in his knapsack, if you understand me. Mm -hmm. And if he carries a handgun in his knapsack, it will be revealed by the, by the scanner when he walks through. So that's fine. But yet still, you have a van or a truck or something that comes on with lots of items that you don't check, you don't scan, and in there you could have drugs, you could have guns, you could have all sorts of illegal materials, and there, there's absolutely no system in place to monitor that. So no wonder you have Tobago now being flooded with illegal guns, illegal drugs, and of course the crime situation escalates, and then of course you see the result in it in the murders. Thankfully, it is still not a runaway horse, you know, as it is in some parts of Trinidad where basically you see the authorities seem to have basically thrown their hands up in the air. Tobago is still the area and the, the, the TTPS police division which can be salvaged. And I urge the new ACP, Mr. Collis Hazel, to really act on that and ensure that Tobago becomes the safest division within the TTPS. Well, uh, let's just hope uh, that uh, such a bold prediction does not go against him as is currently happening uh, with the Commissioner of Police. Uh, with you know, with respect. Well, we 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 no, Well, she still has time. Remember, she said June. <laughs> yeah, she said June. We will give her that month. Mr. George, thank you very much for your time on the program this morning. All so we appreciate pleasure. it. All is a pleasure. Keep listening. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.